Yeah. So we are joined by um, one of our listeners, uh, Steve, and um, you've got a quite fascinating uh, little niche in um, the tank world in your past, Steve. So um, can you say hi and um, tell us a little about what you did in tanks? Oh, sure. Hi, uh, I'm Steve Matthews. I live in New York now, but I was a, a tank commander, tank platoon leader, and tank executive officer, tank company commander at Fort Irwin, which is the National Training Center in Southern California. I was uh, on a Sheridan M551 that had plastic hung all over it to look like, sort of look like a Russian T-72. Um, my unit out there was is also known as the Op 4. Uh, in those days, it was 163 armor, and we paired up with 152 infantry to form a, a Russian uh, motorized rifle regiment called the 32nd Guards Motorized Rifle Regiment. And different units from all over the US and even overseas sometimes would come to the National Training Center and engage in weeks of simulated battle uh, with us. So that's, that's what I did. I was there for four years from 1989 to 1993 and spent probably more time on tanks than most people have been in, in wars, to be honest, because uh, one of the lessons I learned was you don't last very long. <laughs> So the analogy I was sort of going with was that you're basically Tom Skerritt's role in Top Gun, but but for tanks. Uh, I, I suppose so. I, I'm I'm not totally familiar with the the movie Top Gun. I showed it for free on a loop, I think, in my military days. But I would just glance at pieces of it. I don't think I ever saw the whole thing. But uh, we were the NTC was set up. The National Training Center was set up in the late '70s, or it started in the late '70s anyway, and it it was fully up and running by the early '80s as sort of a, a land war analog to Red Flag, which was the Air Force uh, version, I believe, of what's shown in Top Gun. So, yeah, that's not that's not inaccurate, although I don't know about the Tom Skerritt part. Well, Tom Skerritt's role in the movie was to, he was an instructor as well as the opposition force. Now, at your your time in the uh, at the training center, where were you brought, brought in to be an instructor for the tank commanders that were going through, or were you just acting as um, opposition force? We were strictly uh, opposition forces. Um, we were kept separate from what we call blue force, which was the the rotating uh, uh, enemies that would come to visit us. And there was a group of uh, officers called the observer controllers and some NCOs, as I recall. Uh, who would work with the Blue Force as we were uh, engaging them. Now, one, one of the great things about the National Training Center, and I'm, I'm just a huge fan, so it'll, it'll come through, um, is that they, they have a, what they called the Star Wars room that, that kept track of everything that happened on the battlefield. So whereas in previous war games that the Army had conducted going all the way back to probably the early 20th century, it was more of a bang, you're dead type of thing. And, and then everybody would fight over who shot who first. Whereas we had a setup called Miles, which is the multiple integrated laser engagement system that allows you to do basically laser tag on tanks. And the tank that gets hit first is inactivated. So it's laser never fires. So there was no dispute and it was all centrally logged and they could display it on a screen and show exactly what had happened after every battle, which they did as an instructional mechanism. What were the computers like for uh, back then for trying to review this sort of stuff? Was it uh, any sort of um, you know, computerized technology with it or was it still just paper-based? No, no, it was totally computerized. Um, the computers were terrible compared to what they are now, clearly, <laughs> but, uh, but it was good enough. And in fact, the graphics were very low resolution, but it was, again, good enough. With the uh, Sheridans you were driving, um, was it, just a commander and a driver, or did you bother having a gunner in it? Or, I mean, with I guess with the Mars system, you probably did need a gunner, but... Um... We, we did. We had gunners. We did not generally carry a loader with us, <laughs> so that gave us some slack as far as personnel. Uh, however, we were also... Uh, we had the table of organization and equipment of a regular um, armoured battalion, so we had the loaders um, in our platoons, and they would... We would rotate so that people didn't have to be out there all the time. Uh, the the gunner was necessary because there was no there is well at least I don't know if this is true in a real combat M five five one but in the ones we had the commander didn't really have a working sight so the gunner had to lay the gun and, and fire. Now the commander did have an override joystick 
which allowed us to mess around with the gunner or, or you know, turn the turret in the direction we wanted in general, but we couldn't actually lay it on the target from the commander's position. With the uh, with the actual vehicles you were driving, were the were the guns actually operational? Would you go out for a range shoot to, to maintain your own qualifications for firing those um, tanks, or was this a case of they were just for training purposes and not actually doing any live fire um, through their life? Um, the, the the Sheridans that we had had been uh, had been sent to Vietnam at some point. They were very very old. Uh, and they, uh, in fact, one of them that I was on actually had a cracked hull and you could see the road going by underneath, which was pretty amazing when you think about it. I don't know how that happened, but anyway, uh, we, we ended up sending that to the depot and I guess it got refurbished somehow. Um, the tank, so there were two types of vis mods, uh, visual modifications to the M551. One was to be uh, a tank, a T72, and the other was to be a, a BMP. Um, the BMPs would actually have their stubby barrel of the M551 sawn off or cut off somehow. So there'd be a jagged sort of stump sticking out. And then there would be a fake sagger on top of that and uh, and some various hull modifications to make it look longer and more, more bimpy, I guess. And then the tank ones still had the full barrel. So I'm guessing that they could maybe be still employed in some capacity. However, the breech blocks were removed for the, for the miles laser. So... Uh, that's a long way of getting to the fact that no, we didn't qualify on the M551s at all. However, our unit did have also M1s that we used to qualify and do the tank gunnery range and all that. So were they were your M1s part of your unit, or was you basically borrowed somebody else's for those sort of things? They were. I'm having trouble remembering now. I believe what happened was when we qualified, we would take M1s that the Blue Force would normally use. So that's there were some. Point, yeah. Yep. Yeah, there were some loner M1s that the uh, that the Blue Force could take when they when they came out, which no, everyone hated. Everyone hated doing because they wouldn't run for the first you know few days after you got it and stuff like that. They were I really guess, trashed. I guess rather than uh, transporting M1s from all around the country for a uh, for an exercise, you've got some on base already. So yeah, good point. There, um, there was some. There was some of that. There was also some transportation from around the country. Rail cars would show up. Uh, Barstow is the town forty miles south of. Fort Irwin, it's a big rail junction, and they would unload lots of vehicles when when new units would come. So it was a mixture. Now, during your time there was uh, the lead up to Gulf War One in 91, 92, or December 91, or whatever it was. Um, was there an increase in training in the, uh, the six weeks or six months uh, or was it, uh, from the invasion of uh, Kuwait to um, the Operation Desert Storm, or was it a case of there's, if you're not trained now, you, you're not going to be trained. So we're not going to try and push uh, too many people through. We're just going to be busy getting everything ready. Do you it was a time? mixture. It, it, I remember it very well. It was, uh, it was, we had we normally had a very busy uh, uh, demanding schedule and it got way worse um, when, when Saddam attacked Kuwait. I actually got task organized over to the engineers because they were afraid the engineers were all going to get killed at the berm. Um, and they thought they might need new engineers. They ended up, of course, of course not needing not needing us. But um, we were training, uh, frantically training the National Guard units to try to get them ready to go, namely the 48th Brigade from Georgia. And then, then there was like the 115th from Mississippi or something like that. The post commander at the time, or yeah, the post commander, General Clark, Wesley Clark, you may have heard of him, um, <laughs> basically decided after watching that training and we worked and worked to train these guys that, that they were unqualified to go. And it was politically controversial at the time. Um, the 48th brigade commander in particular accused uh, the NTC of being biased against the national guard, which it's probably fair to say we were somewhat, but, but there were incidents that were pretty horrifying. I watched an entire M1 burn to the ground after the, the, uh, the national guardsmen had, set a fire in there and and, and fled <laughs> it was it was, uh, it was pretty amazing to see it burned that, for days by the way that's interesting because I mean those similar accusations um, were were made in the what the Missouri exercises in um, uh, in the lead up to World War II um, and again in that case were found to be um, as in the, the National Guard was not up to scratch and needed more training uh, it's funny to hear that came around again. 
Yeah, well, I can tell you, uh, as someone who was on the inside of that, we really, we really made a tremendous effort to get them certified. And we, well, it wasn't my decision, but there were people way above me who decided that they never were. And the funny thing is, you've actually saved their lives by not certifying them if they're not ready to go. Well, Gulf War One wasn't particularly stressful for the, no, the it blue force worse, side. <laughs> it certainly could have been, and we were very we were very concerned about about facing the Iraqi army at that time. It seems kind of funny to say now after what happened, but uh, we one, considered one them to be one bad traffic jam as they were going uh, uh, doing the crossways maneuvers with what, uh, two divisions or however many brigades of tanks it was going across each other. And you snarl that up and you're just one big parking lot. That would not have been a, uh, uh, it could have all gone bad. But uh, yeah, but it wasn't. And so it didn't. And uh, away we went. Right. Uh, look, Steve, I'm really interested in, did you have any signature moves that you, um, you know, particularly try to simulate a, a red force? Was there anything out of the ordinary, well, out of the American trading ordinary that you did to try and, send some or, training messages or did you follow the uh, the, the, the standard soviet or eastern bloc uh, doctrine of uh, uh, mass waves or anything like that or what was the go we really uh we kept it simple um there was a school that we attended that the i think everyone attended it but anyway all the leaders attended um called uh, the op for academy that we went to it took about a month i think when when i arrived in december of 89 um and we would, to some extent, we already knew Soviet doctrine, but we would really hammer it in um, and get get it fully uh, fully memorized and understood. And it was it was very simple. We had three different formations: nine nine nine, three three three, and one one one, which was basically column and and echelon. Uh, you know, you would basically get to the to the battle area or the wherever we anticipated the engagement to occur you know, in a column and then deploy um, to, to the left and the right and and attack and keep attacking. Uh, it wasn't that complicated. The We won more than 90% of the time in these engagements, which was intentional on the part of the designers of the National Training Center because it's been noted in many, in many uh, environments that losers learn more than winners. And the whole point was for Blue Force to learn. The reason we won so much there were, there were, in my opinion, there were two big reasons. Number one, we knew the terrain like the back of our hands. Now, Fort Irwin is a huge base. It's bigger than the state of Rhode Island, um, but it's, uh, but we were out there all the time and we got to know everything. So when we were doing an engagement, we had already done the same thing probably, well, the unit had done it 20 or 30 times, regardless of where it was on the post. And each individual had done it at least a few times. So the the familiarity with the, the desert isn't nearly as flat as it looks at, in California. And there are places you can hide tanks for sure. And we would routinely just appear in places where Blue Force did not expect us to appear. So that's number one. That was probably the bigger of the two reasons. But the other, the other big thing that the Op4 had going for it was that we did it all the time. So even on any terrain, we would have been way better than Blue Force that only actually got out on the tanks maybe once a year or, or once every couple months at most. We were out 14 days out of 24 every month every month of the year. Well, every 24-day increment of the year, which is more than 12, obviously. Um, our schedule was three days of preparation, 14 days in the field, three days of cleanup, and then a four-day break. And we just repeated that all year. So... And by the way, a four-day break over 24 days, it, in some ways, is is better than having a short weekend every seven days, uh, because, you know, we were in the middle of the desert in Southern California, and if you wanted to go somewhere, it took a little while, mm -hmm. and then you could have a significant number amount of time wherever you went, San Diego or Las Vegas or whatever. It was a demanding schedule. Being out in the field 14 days uh, on and off was, uh, but but it was such a great training event and uh, such a great opportunity to get to know and work with all the people in the unit. It was really a, I think it's a really nice, nice way to do it. With getting back to the Sheridans, was it, uh, do you think they were chosen because of their high mobility and, uh, and speed or 
um, or just because they were different from, uh, they had them in stock and they were different from the M1s that were available. Uh, what were your thoughts on, because they were probably, they were, if any of the M60s that were still lying around, I uh, wouldn't have had the mobility of the uh, Sheridans. Well, when I was an engineer platoon leader in the Op4, I was an Op4 engineer platoon leader. I had a CEV, which was an old uh, M60 with the big, big cannon on it and the, the block and tackle and all that stuff um, and, a, and a bulldozer blade and you name it. Um, so there were a few odds and ends in terms of vehicles out there. Uh, oh, and I forgot one of the Viz mods was the ZSU-23-402 um, anti-aircraft. Uh, the, the big four-barreled gun that we saw yeah, you seeing. Uh, they're all, on. exactly, they're all Sheridans underneath. Okay, I think you missed one of the reasons why, why they wanted to use the Sheridan. It's very cheap to maintain. Um, the fact that the engine and transmission are the same as a lot of the buses, and in fact, a lot of our old mechanics who retired or left the Army for some reason did end up going to work for bus companies because they already knew that engine and transmission. Um, made it very That's cheap. That is a really interesting point, and I've never heard anyone say before that the Sheridan actually had a um, easy to maintain uh, system. So that's uh, and that's a, good to and know. a bus and a bus and uh, engine and transmission. That is, um, yeah, we no, always loved the Matilda for the same reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to say it was easy to maintain. We had a lot of trouble. You know, any tank is difficult to maintain, at least in my experience, but. In terms of the cost to the army of getting the parts and and uh, and replacing things, it was very low. Um, the other issue is the Sheridan is small, and so you can hang a lot of plastic on the outside and make it look like a real tank, sort of, um, and make it look like a bimp and all that stuff. So if they had tried to do that with uh, with an M60 or an M1, it would have looked ridiculous. Yeah, and of course, the T72 is, um, by the rest of the world's main battle tank standards, a very small tank. So you can't start with anything too large and uh, get up to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm about 5'10". I think that's 170 centimetres. And uh, I can't really fit in the T72. I've tried. Strange, because the uh, Chieftain fits, uh, fits in the driver's seat, and we've seen, as I've seen him. Not very well, though, Rob. <laughs> Uh, I was in the commander's hatch. I didn't try the driver's, the driver's seat. But uh, yeah, I couldn't close the hatch. My head was too high up. Um, so, so yeah, the, the Sheridans were uh, really, uh, you had to have a skilled driver because I think, I think you touched on it in your 551 episode, the, the flywheel tears. It's, it's an aluminum flywheel and it tears under enough stress. And many times uh, Sheridans would just stop when they were trying to go up a hill because this flywheel was destroyed. Yeah, right. Because, I mean, once, once a flywheel starts to tear, things are going to go bad very quickly. They're not going to improve. Well, no. Yeah. It, it, once it starts, it's over. You know, it, it, it immediately deforms grossly and, and basically tears in half. So I've heard stories about the uh, the, the training area uh, where the uh, the centre was. Uh, things such as you have to break for uh, tortoises as they're wandering across the desert, uh, and all sorts of uh, people uh, getting too heated in their uh, M ones uh, because they're not used to the to the heat and so forth, and passing out from uh, heat stroke and so forth. Are those all those stories sort of stories true or? Well, the desert tortoise was a huge issue when I was there. And the, the problem with the desert tortoise, well, one of the many problems is <clears throat> it looks exactly like a helmet sitting on the ground. Uh, they, you see it, you can see them, and there are things laying around in the desert from 50 years or more of exercises. And yeah, and the other thing about the desert tortoise is if you approach it or disturb it in any way, it does what's called dropping its water and then it can very easily die of thirst in the in the coming days or weeks um so yeah they're a real problem however uh, military bases around the u.s and maybe around the world for all i know have issues because they are such a congenial environment for various endangered species where uh you know it, suburbs destroy all the habitat for these animals but ranges despite all the explosives and gunfire and so on are actually pretty congenial for them and and they, these bases always end up in trouble because there's some endangered creature that only lives there. Um, well, in, in Australia, it's the kangaroos. So the military bases have uh, nice, uh, well-watered um, sports fields and the kangaroos will come down and eat all the grass on there. And so they'll have huge uh, 
uh, populations of kangaroos on the base. And when they go jumping off onto uh, civilian roads as people are driving past and get hit by it and jump in front of a car and get hit, uh, hit then the um, civilian uh, the people then ring up the army base and uh, say, your kangaroos hit my car and uh, I'm putting in an insurance claim against you because they can see the ball sitting on the, uh, on the, um, uh, on the rugby field or something like that. So, yeah, it is, it is a problem in Australia as well. One thing I, I forgot to mention about the Vismod that you might find interesting is that the, uh, of course, the Sheridan gun tube is way too small to look like a T-72, right? So what they did was they stuck a length of sewer pipe on it, um, and and then they found that the <clears throat> the plastic would sag in such a way that the laser didn't make it out the front of the of the gun, and so they put due on the uh, some, they put some. I don't know if it was due to the heat or not, but. Uh, mm -hmm. But anyway, it would, it's a very long piece of sewer pipe and it doesn't, it's flexible. So they would, uh, they had this thing called a knee brace that they put on it, which is a, a length of angle iron with two steel rings on either end that they slip over the, the sewer pipe to keep it more or less rigid so that the laser would actually make it out of the end of the barrel. Do you have any, uh, sort, of quote, any sort of uh, slang name the uh, crews would call that uh, device? That well, the knee brace. I, you know what? There, there was something, and I don't remember what it was. I, I have a vague remember, a uh, vague memory of a salacious name for it, but I can't remember now. Um, the other thing about the heat, uh, it was as op for living there. It didn't really bother us that much. I remember one time it got up to, I think, I had I carried a thermometer around with me. I think it got to one twenty three, and that was, of course, not in the sun. Um, and that was pretty crushing. We were kind of all just sitting around wondering when it was going to end. But the one thing I, that I remember very well was that the tank would stay cool during the day, generally, from the night. Um, and then at night, the tank would be quite hot. So if you were fighting at night, you'd have trouble with the heat. Where, but then it would be cool outside. So the tank is kind of out of phase with the temperature outside. And it, it almost uh, makes for a comfortable environment. One one. We did have a number of heat exhaustion cases. I would say heat stroke was rare, but heat exhaustion requiring uh, rehydration would, would occur with some, some regularity, particularly when we were forced to participate in change of command ceremonies on the base, where we'd all stand there at attention for however long the general wanted to talk. And I remember the sound of you know helmets and rifles hitting the ground at those a fair amount. Yeah, yeah, I've heard those plenty of times. Yeah, look, um, you know, Rob's actually been one of the ones standing at attention. I've, I've been to enough parades watching people uh, passing out, um, and I'm sure many of our um, audience uh, can commiserate on that one. Um, Steve, I, I tried to get an answer on this before, but, you know, was there anything that Op4 sort of developed that gave you an advantage over, uh, you know, you, you're saying that you generally won the, the engagements uh, with, with experience, Um and is, is, is there anything that inexperienced tankers do that you can take advantage of as a simulated tank ace? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of dumb stuff that, that Blue Force would, would uh, repeatedly do. Um, they were way too tentative. Like the, the name of the game, uh, at least for us, was to just hurl ourselves at the enemy and, and just kill and keep killing till you got to the rear area or died yourself. The... Due to the Sorry. doctrine, was that due to the doctrine you were employing, or was that just be your experience and um, uh, of no and knowledge of what you were doing? Um, um... Well, it starts out as as a novice. It starts out as just the doctrine you were taught, and then as you experience it, and you know, I've I've been in well, I don't know, five hundred or something large simulated tank battles. Um, it just it just seems smart after a little while. You see how it works against the sort of uh, more flexible, tentative American doctrine, and and that may be terrain dictated. I mean, it was always fairly open terrain, so maybe those tactics are suited to that. I don't know, um, but it it was uh, it was obviously very successful. Now, one thing I do have to say though is the winning side of an NTC battle normally has less, you know, ten percent or less of its strength remaining. So these are always bloodbaths, um, and. I guess that's more okay on the 
on the we were called Krasnovian, by the way. That was the name for <laughs> Russia. Um, that was one of the questions I was going to ask, is because uh, in Australia at uh, the, at the time the the opposition force was called the Missourians with an A rather than an I, mm-hmm. and uh, as the uh, as the Soviet bloc, Eastern bloc, uh, uh, large force and. Um, so when people would run, in, run around as the op- opposition forces, that's what they're called. So you were the Krasnovians. That's right. That's what we were. And then we developed other personalities uh, as a result of getting ready to face the Iraqis and, and other potential enemies. But, uh, but the Krasnovian is what I was pretty much the whole time. Do you have unit patches from those days as the simulated guards rifles? Um, yes. Yes, I do somewhere. Um, the... Uh, we were at the time we were the 177th heavy armor brigade, uh, which included three battalions, uh, the 163 armor, the 152 infantry and the 177th forward support battalion. Um, and they, uh, but we would have, we had Russian ish uniforms as well that included a black beret and, you know, the whole get up. I, I think, uh, senior army officers spend a lot of time thinking about what uniforms they'd like to see people wearing. Um, <laughs> And uh, we had patches and everything uh, for both both sets of outfits. But now the unit has been reflagged as the 11th Armored uh, Cavalry Regiment, which used to be the, the one in Folded Gap, you may recall. Wow. Uh, but, <laughs> but after the European heat was off to some extent, they reflagged the 177th Armor Brigade as the 11th ACR, and they're, they're the op four now. Yeah, I have all kinds of stuff. I have, uh, well, I have... Uh, this helmet that I used to wear, uh, this is this is a Miles device taped to it that's been there for 30 years now. Um, so the Miles device, that's a receiver for incoming laser shots? Yeah, these... Big, these... big laser tag, but much heavier. Yeah, yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, we actually got used to wearing very heavy helmets with all this equipment on them. Uh, <laughs> and then there's a similar thing like this that goes on the tank itself. Uh, mm. Big big belts that go around the turret and... Uh, and they can detect the light. Actually, one time I, my crew and I were coming up a hill. Uh, I forget, it had a number associated, I think Hill 780 or something. Anyway, anybody who's been to the NTC knows this hill. Uh, and we were surprised by an A-10 on the other side of the hill, uh, the aircraft, the Warhog. Yeah. And uh, his lights were blinking as he came up and, and it killed the tank the commander, the gunner, and the driver. And the gunner couldn't even see out of the tank at the time. So those lasers were flying all over the place. Uh, so we could each individually die as well as the tank could die. Okay, so the A-10 was, was, had the mile system on it and it was... Uh, pra- oh, okay. Wow. Okay. Yes, uh, there were all kinds of vehicles with mile systems on them. Uh, and one time, uh, uh, a fighter bomber uh, was, was hazing us, basically. They, it, we were sitting there dead, so when your tank dies, you just basically lay around on the deck and wait for the battle to end. And uh, an A-10 flew right to us and then turned 90 degrees up and cooked us with the with the, the jet uh it was really it shockingly was hot oh it was, uh, it was it was kind of scary a little bit and then he was gone so it didn't matter but uh we felt kind of toasted wow so it was close it would have felt close enough to touch I, I don't know. It was just very, very hot. I think my eyes were closed, uh, and uh, I didn't, I didn't really see what was going on. But I really felt the the blast of heat. It's a lot more than than a hair dryer. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Wow. Because I mean, I've I've had a F eighteen um, go over me about twenty meters above, and uh, it felt incredibly close. But I wasn't feeling the jet wash. So uh, wow. Okay. No, I, I've talked to pilots since then uh, who flew at the NTC, and they said that they would do that on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> nice one. Um, so, Steve, before we let you go, uh, any any last words of advice for um, aspiring uh, tank commanders? Well, one time my, uh, the, okay, so the Sheridan uh, cupola, the commander's cupola and turret are electric, not, not hydraulic, I guess, maybe because of the things you talked about in your 551 episode <laughs> with the, cherry spray or whatever it was called cherry um, pipping, yeah there you go cherry pipping yeah um so uh one time the cupola uh control box actually started burning um and i was standing in the commander's hatch and i said oh i think we might be on fire and the gunner 
jumped out of his seat and climbed up my uniform to get out of the tank before me. <laughs> so my message to aspiring tank commanders, at least in this instance, would be don't say anything if there's a fire. Just get out yourself. Or be big enough that they can't fit past you in the hatch. <laughs> I think I'm I think, extremely good to know. <laughs> I think on that note, we might uh, let you go to see. That's, that was, that's hilarious. <laughs> well, it was really great to meet you guys, and I love the podcast. So keep up Thank the good you. work. We appreciate it.